so a few things first uh, in in preparation for the upcoming sessions um, uh, I'm not entirely sure if I out had outlined this already because there are some plans and uh, opportunities that we want to um, use in order to um, um, you know deal with some sort of um, uh, increase increase your learning to, to some extent and the idea is as follows um, this week uh, I saw a Tux penguin in, in some sort of uh, icon I couldn't resist um, this week, uh, I'm, I'm trying to provide a bit of a scene of this uh, course more on code um, uh, computing initially because uh, we have only briefly talked about it and largely spent the time last week on um, setting up uh, and defining the um, uh, you know course parameters in the widest sense. Um, and uh, following this brief introduction, which is kind of um, um, hopefully contained within uh, the earlier part of this session, we'll then look into uh, your Linux uh, situation and in terms of your, your experiences in terms of Linux, uh, both um, based uh, uh, inquiring more details uh, now and um, to see what we can uh, talk about on Wednesday, specifically things that need to be made up for and uh, that we want to re, uh, re, re, re reinforce. So it's something uh, it's quite important for you to provide me some feedback and uh, input today as well. But um, after that, next week, what we're going to do is to, um, well, affect your scheduling sensitively again. And the reason is as follows. Once we um, have, um, you know, a sufficiently um, sufficient baseline in, in understanding of Linux, it's uh, not too challenging what we need for this course. In fact, it's mostly uh, just to ensure that everyone is on board. Um, next week, um, um, Marsh will start talking about uh, Go or Go Lang specifically um, as a programming language, and we'll do that for um, as far as the planning goes. Two weeks now. It depends a bit on progress. Uh, we are working to some extent agile in the sense that. Uh, uh, we, we want to ensure that um, the content that we disseminate um, kind of um, sets well and set, um, sits well with you guys. And he teaches this as part of his advanced programming course, which um, is taught um, on Tuesday mornings, that is. And um, I, I guess uh, three fifths of the class take this course anyway, I believe. And um, this is uh, the idea that um, uh, next week um, that um, you will the specifically relating to anyone who is not in a big pro uh, class, um, you will basically join that particular session on um, Tuesday, I believe. Um, and the Wednesday session is unchanged with ours. So we still have this kind of interaction between um, 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 between us on, on Wednesdays, of course. Um, and uh, the idea is basically, yeah, you, you um, that we kind of co-teach uh, or he teaches Golang to both um, classes. So that is the uh, data engineer students that are joining the advanced programming class for those two weeks only, only those two weeks. Um, and uh, later on, then we're returning to our normal slot. And uh, the argument is basically that you get um, the same background, same material, because he will teach Golang anyway for his class, uh, which is the big pro class. And it would be very confusing or disadvantageous for uh, anyone else who is also in the course um, to not get the same exposure, right? So hence uh, a bit of a re adjustment of the schedule there. I'll send, of course, a detailed overview in, um, in the issue tracker. So uh, by now I hope or expect actually that everyone is somewhat signed up to um, both the wiki and has subscribed to all the different labels for issues. I don't have any outstanding ac um, access requests. So I'm fairly convinced that most of you are actually in the um, GitHub um, project already for our course. Um, and then um, after having done this for two weeks, we'll return again again into our cloud setting and um, we'll then be in a situation both to have a Linux background, hopefully, right? So we can work on this uh, if needed along the way further, um, a Go background, and then we can actually be productive in terms of programming. And what we'll do then is to move more towards cloud programming uh, and look into a REST framework specifically, and uh, then a deployment on uh, Heroku, for example, as an example of a platform, uh, um, um, yeah, a past service as we'll uh, learn to know in a bit. Um, so this would kind of be would be the plot of the next three weeks effectively of the course um, until we then uh, um, continue and um, with dedicated cloud topics and assuming then that Golang is also settled as a programming language throughout the rest of the course. Um, does that make sense? Are there any questions? Let's see if I have an eye on the chat. Oh, 
Okay, seems to be straightforward. Okay, makes sense. That's that good. Yeah. So uh, it's a bit of a sorry for that uh, uh, coordination. Took a bit of time because of our rescheduling and in in in, in, in converse the um, adaptation of uh, my schedule as well. It's just to ensure that we are all on the same track. And depending the direction that uh, he takes it in Golang, sorry, in the in in the advanced programming course, which may be more on the theoretical side in some instances, not so much the teaching, but the the the, the topics, uh, will bring it then back eventually to the cloud side, right? Specifically cloud service, because Golang is a general purpose programming language, as um, you know, um, many of the other languages you have learned so far, and that's good. Um, but we of course uh, apply it pragmatically in the context of uh, cloud technologies. Cool. All right. All right. Last week. Um, um, having settled that, uh, last week I asked you briefly to uh, install Linux. So before we continue, there's a question, when will assignment one be announced? Um, we'll certainly do that um, before the end of the um, Golang session. So uh, end of this month or beginning of February latest. Um, the earlier the better, the problem is too early is problematic. And the reason is very simple um, because if we haven't talked about um, the, the uh, necessary foundations, you may drift off in directions, uh, solving the assignment that would be uh, uh, yeah, not to, to your advantage because it's better you know, to have, um, have had the necessary conceptual sessions first before you actually embark on doing it yourself. Otherwise, we're largely just following, the, uh, following Stack Overflow and that may not necessarily uh, be good, good outcomes there in our experience. That's the challenge there, because otherwise you would be reforced, forced to rewrite the assignment or, or elements of it and so on. Uh, it has not worked in our favor in the past, unfortunately. Otherwise, had, we would um, put out the assignment even earlier. Um, in any case, you'll, um, you, you'll get it uh, early enough and you'll have ample time to um, complete it because we'll only have two assignments plus the project in the course. And before that, we'll provide you with some selected enter, uh, exercises just to ensure that you, um, um, you know, catch up on um, you know, your, your go abilities and so on. Those exercises will generally not be marked, but they just be for your own uh, reinforcement. So the idea is there that you can do them as your perusal. Um, so, I hope that responds to that uh, question. Are there any other organizational questions that I um, should address um, before getting started? You can, of course, type those out throughout the um, session. So um, last week, I asked everyone to kind of set up the VirtualBox um, container because that will be the foundation you know, for, for, for any sort of training exercise and so on that uh, you will be doing or you know like <laughs> largely being a playground to be realistic because in many instances we'll use um, um, will of course use some sort of cloud service for deployment um, but you can use it for develop if you like to but generally it's not that well performing and you can also develop locally as long as you have at eventually a, a Linux environment at your hand cool um, so everyone seems to have gotten it running which is kind of good. Okay, okay. So, but before we uh, turn to Linux, I just wanted to um, uh, first motivate some uh, or, or um, talk about some of the aspects that I kind of want to put forward when we talk about cloud computing, because we need to remember that the course is not about Go, the course is not about Linux, the course is about cloud technologies. And that's the main main point. And that's why I feel um, that's good that we just talk a bit more about cloud computing first as a motivation, because then for two or three weeks, we'll just look at technology specifically, right? So without coming back to this um, high level perspective, and it's important to kind of motivate this sensibly first. So hence a bit of a, uh, a reflection, but also an opportunity to kind of learn more about uh, what you are um, um, doing and why you're doing this in the first place. So let's see if I can share my screen. Let's give me a second, pressing the right buttons here. Voila. So um, cloud computing. In fact, the, the name is somewhat misleading. Cloud technologies is the course computing here specifically because um, this is um, one aspect uh, um, related to executing something well, you know, in, in the cloud, if you if you if you want. Um, and uh, last week, we briefly got an idea what cloud computing actually uh, is. Right. So and um, we, we are, there's two questions that um, or how it 
looks like if you like from a developer or user perspective what we want to um, identify um, today a bit more is um, the motivations behind it so we had some ideas why we're doing it but i think we want to pin this down even more so it's really clear that where the motivation sits um, um, from and uh, this looks at you as more as like um, decision makers designers in a way uh, of systems um, and kind of uh, aims at kind of getting your, your understanding there uh, a bit more. And the second aspect is that we look a bit or uh, at least um, develop a terminological basis. We'll pick up on this later, of course, but develop a terminological basis of what, um, um, you know, principles we constantly will refer to. And any, um, I think, yeah, pretty much any technology you use will make use of those concepts in one way or another. So it's, I think, very important to get a shared understanding um, first, before we look at skill development further. So, um, right. So, I mean, one of the principles that you think about when you think about cloud computing is, of course, uh, we talked about it last week that, uh, you know, you can um, run, uh, well, stuff in the cloud, right? So, in a cloud basically just means it's um, transformed from a um, deployment that you uh, run locally uh, in transformed into an abstract service, right? So you no longer buy a product per se as such or deploy a product, right? The classical move of installing your own um, network environment on your own uh, data center in your own company and so on, um, but rather to procure uh, services. And we saw that in the software realm quite quite intensely that pretty much all big uh, vendors have shifted to a service model, be it Microsoft, Adobe, uh, or any of those kinds. Um, and uh, uh, along with this, with this kind of uh, provision as a service of software, uh, comes, of course, the necessity also to uh, no longer be responsible for running it, right? So it's an extreme change in terms of um, operations that has uh, occurred, whereas, uh, you know, um, a considerable fraction of your um, budget uh, previously in companies was basically dedicated to uh, running software that you procured and had to procure, you know, Active Directory and, and Office Exchange and, you know, whatever other infrastructure you may need in a, in a given company here assumed Microsoft but may also be translatable into a Unix or Linux environment where you run the corresponding services there it's now run elsewhere and the only thing that you really need is basically the internet connection to connect to it but you what you don't really know is how it's run what hardware it's run on um, and um, um, you know who configures this and so on so it's completely detached there's an abstraction level there and fundamental fundamentally the transformation um, follows the idea um, th that you know you shift to a pay-as-you-go model um, and um, instead of having this um, uh, large sum or the significant uh, investment that you need to take in buying software possibly even licenses and so on here the idea is that you can actually um, be adaptive and you know scale up and scale down uh, as you see fit and need um, for example you have more users you buy an additional license you have less users you don't renew that not I said buy before, I meant subscribe to additional licenses. And uh, once you don't have that need anymore because your company shrinks, you also have the flexibility to adapt to us quite flexibly. So uh, fixed cost reduction is one of the main um, main drivers in this um, process. So, um, but now, because to you, I mean, uh, short, shortly to you, um, as a service, which, um, so if you think about as a service, it has become a bit of a buzzword as, right? So, um, what kind of services, what kind of um, uh, acronyms do you know? Just put them in the chat or um, speak up if you like. I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm completely fine with you just um, interrupting me. It's no problem. Let's see if I get my chat back working. Yeah, good. We got one response, more responses. Ah, cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh-huh. Mm. Very nice. Cool. It seems to be so. Uh, just to read it out loud for the sake of um, um, keeping it on the stream. Responses include infrastructure, security, platform, software, products, and then another uh, collation of uh, platform, infrastructure, software, metal. Metal is a service. Interesting. Okay. Well, I'm learning every time. Is there is there is there another one that uh, we can consider? Does anyone uh, have another one in mind that uh, may have not been mentioned? Yeah, storage as a service is, uh, um, of course. I mean, yeah, in fact, absolutely. 
Uh, but this is very, um, storage is very, um, let's say, uh, technical, right? It's very specific to storage only. Generally, the abstractions sit a bit higher. But if we look at one that's more processing centric, what other uh, abstraction do we uh, uh, do we have nowadays? Do we need to buy, you know, um, if we, we, the, 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 do we always need to subscribe to distinct um, uh, so software services and so on that we buy? Um, bum, bum, bum. Uh -huh, we're getting closer here. So um, there's uh, compute, of course, cloud computing, good. GPU fast for rendering and AI. That's a brilliant one. So it's a very technical uh, one. It's useful back end to closer to infrastructure. I would say containers. Yeah, that's so related to virtualization concepts or at least application level virtualization, something we need to, we will touch up on anyway. So this is more heavily taught, of course, in the operations courses. Uh, provided by Eeg, if I understand, but we'll definitely touch up on those. Uh, gaming systems is a new, th that's right, that's a very good point, uh, since you mentioned is Google Stadia and Akin, right? So, um, which have uh, gained more prominence in recent years that we actually ran machine dedicated for gaming simply, simply because it's so much uh, performance, uh, so performance sensitive. We have the desktop uh, reference, which is uh, similar, that's right, network software, networks are very important, software again. Um, okay. Um, did anyone hear about functions as a service before? So that's another kind of, um, to so, yeah, to some extent. Uh, we'll, that's something we'll talk about um, as well uh, br briefly uh, throughout the course. In fact, it's not th that 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 central um, to the course, but it's a uh, more recent kind of. Um, um, you know, emergent uh, form of uh, as a service instances. So uh, we will largely focus on um, software as a service, platform as a service, and um, infrastructure as a service, of course, the main big um, three ones. But function as a service, the idea is that we can go beyond, below granularity of software. So the idea is there that you can, in, in, in fact, in an ideal world, uh, could actually decompose um, if you want um, your software into um, individual functions. For example, you just want to provide to third party uh, a, a, a business function. Let's say you're doing a, a prediction on stocks or something like this, right? But you don't necessarily want to write a whole service about it, but some minuscule function that you want to expose and that um, uh, you know others can invoke against payment, of course. So then you'll be able to now decompose your application into those uh, you know, um, uh, uh, um, uh, self-contained functions, basically, that don't require a comprehensive software service anymore. And uh, the implementation that you find, if you know about AWS, uh, we talk about those as well, what, what this means, uh, you'll find it's AWS Lambda, for example. It's, uh, exactly. Exactly. So exactly. It just came in the chat. That's precisely what the purpose is. And that's uh, um, um, often referred to as serverless computing, right? Because you don't have a dedicated instance of a server that you can address anymore. It's just an endpoint that you're interacting with. And that basically just instantiates one code snippet, or simply speaking, that is self-contained and contains, um, you know, drives function execution, provides you with the response. So, uh, but anyway, that's more like a recent flavor and will not spend much time on it rather than motivating it and perhaps picking up on it later. In any case, uh, there, there will be resources that you can look up in order to um, exploit. So there's a question by Ellen that suggests, is it um, uh, related to microservices? Let's go with this one first. Um, yes and uh, no, it can be the, the um, yes in a sense that it decomposes the software system into even smaller parts, right? That could be, uh, considered microservice. The main difference between AWS Lambda and microservice per se is that generally uh, persistence is not so much of concern. So uh, in microservice, the idea is that you have a, mini, you know, um, um, kind of a, uh, yeah, minified service in, 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 in a sense that is um, wholly self-contained. Um, and that also includes storage and persistence and so on. And that's not an objective of Lambda. In fact, um, in some instances, you can't even do it. I'm not sure. I think AWS allows it, but though, but it's generally not a good idea to do it because um, you need to think about the Lambda invocation as a um, um, invocation of an um, atomic piece of software, if you like, and that is then afterwards, its runtime is controlled by the service, in this case, for example, by AWS. And after some given timeout and so on, in some instances configurable, some others not, they are switch it off, they turn it off. And um, so uh, managing persistence with this is really painful uh, in a way. So you may be better off having a more dedicated uh, microservice concept. Um, Container as a service. Yes, good point. Good point. Good point. It becomes increasingly more popular. And the idea is there um, 
containers? Does everyone know about containers in this class? That, or perhaps someone who can someone indicate that they don't hear didn't hear about container and Docker yet? Just to know, so we we know what. Um, I understand there's this, um, quite a number of you who have already exposure. Um, you may okay, cool. Okay, so there's there's a demand for containers. So the idea is, um, just just very briefly, um, is that we even within. So if you think about your computer, your machine, you're of course running an operating system, right? So operating system, you have services, you have probably databases and um, um, and um, uh, users installed, and a lot of uh, you know lateral configuration of software. But the the um, uh, thing Carol points to Docker exactly. So that's one one example of um, um, container services. Uh, and the idea is there: can you extract from this host operating system in a way that you only um, uh, that that you can write or run an application, dedicated application in a container um, on the system, so it does not. Uh, um, interfere with the operating system at large. So it itself should not affect the operating system, but more importantly, that it's isolated from other applications that run on the same uh, machine, if you like, right? Uh, in an ideal world, they are isolated as well, but they're technically not isolated. For example, uh, in principle, applications as they run now, they uh, have access to the same file system, right? So again, we can deal with permissions to deal with all this and so on, uh, of course, but um, they have the same view even of, of the wild file system as well. And um, the idea is uh, and yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, I'm reading the chat while responding. So the idea is to kind of isolate everything to an extent that either application is completely independent of another, right? So we have um, independence on CPU level, uh, file system level, um, in, in you, configured users, uh, network access, and even network configurations, and so on. Um, so that's that's the main idea that um, applications are you know um, somewhat self-contained, including the entire configuration and runtime, um, but uh, only mitigated via you know for example some some sort of um, um, uh, daemon or background service Docker daemon in this instance, uh, and but you don't really com install a complete operating system like in a VM as you did for VirtualBox, you know, with everything including UI and all this stuff, but really a subset of the functionality that you actually need. Um, and uh, but comprehensively, and then are able to easily redistribute it by providing this Docker container that anyone who has this Docker service, Docker daemon, can uh, uh, instantiate uh, without much fuss. So if you think about configuring and downloading software, especially on Linux, can be a painful experience. Again, there are mitigations and so on, but there are um, uh, still remain challenges. For example, incompatibility with existing software and system and so on. And Docker containers can, for example, Docker containers uh, can mitigate this. So, in as part of this course, we'll primarily focus, of course, um, on uh, in the big picture, including programming and so on. But we'll also have you write some Docker containers, so it becomes very clear what it actually means. Uh, and how you write so-called Docker files, for example, that's the, talk, the technology that we are um, thinking about. And uh, Karam has a very, very good point here. It's a kind of a sandbox, right? So it's really like a sandboxed environment that runs as close as possible on uh, your your machine, so uh, to avoid um, uh, too much abstraction. So you have um, you know highest possible level of performance um, uh, handed through to the Docker container, but uh, nevertheless it um, seeks isolation. So we talk about Docker container images and things like that. And a VM, there's a question by Carol. Well, okay, what's the difference to VM? The M is really that the VM uh, emulates the entire hardware again. So it doesn't provide just the mapping between what you see from within the Docker container onto how it looks in the actual file system on the host system, but instead it emulates the entire machine, including CPUs, including RAM, including um, uh, uh, you know, dedicated file system, as you probably, uh, you may have felt the pain when setting up VirtualBox that you need to specify disk size, for example, and so on, and uh, dedicated networking and, and so on. So you're really comprehensively uh, emulating in software, well, there's hardware support, different story, but in software, fundamentally a full computer um, or full machine. And uh, Docker doesn't do that. It focuses uh, only on a mapping on the, onto the host machine and gives the illusion to the abstraction that it's the uh, application that is completely uh, run in isolation and that there's no other application it interferes with. Whereas in practice, of course, it, it, it may well do so. Um, but again, this is hidden from the application. Of course, uh, um, um, following up on your earlier uh, comment, uh, Carol, it's of course a security feature built or associated with this, that it's um, uh, easier to isolate um, 
and manage selected Docker containers, exchange them, um, you know, but probably more so the convenience factor of just, you know, being able to instantiate them, removing them, restarting them and all that kind of jazz without thinking about the implications on the wider system. So this isolation has its, uh, found its merits in adoption. We'll talk more about this certainly later in the course, um, but I think you, you brought us on the right track and I really like that um, discussion that we're having here. We'll talk about this, of course, on a more technical um, level. Um, yeah, and uh, Jongen makes a good point. Um, so, um, um, it, that the that the scaling of containers is better than a VM. Yeah, and that's a, that's the main point actually. Why not just you know reboot, uh, reinstantiate other VMs uh, you know in a system if you need more performance? Well, guess what? There's a massive overhead associated with the emulation of an entire PC with all its features and uh, um, functionality, right? And you notice this when you start VirtualBox, how much slower this is compared to your host operating system, for example, right? You you you. That's why one of the recommendations we offered uh, last week was uh, not to engage in development on uh, VirtualBox, ideally, or you can try it, of course, if you have a sufficiently powerful host machine, but the abstractions are so high that it becomes a bit of a painful experience. So we're probably suggesting you to do this on the um, on, on the host system. And while you can, in principle, do the that kind of same in a Docker container, it's primarily made for runtime execution. So meaning if you have something that you want to just deploy without you know direct user interaction via a GUI or UI, whatever else, but purely as a service, then you would, uh, you know, um, make it a Docker container and run it on a, um, a machine amongst other Docker containers possibly. And then there's the nice feature of possibly scaling it up. You need more performance? Well, you start a second instance of the same Docker container, right? Of course, your software needs to be able to accommodate this and um, reflect this, um, you know, uh, have concepts of, of, of scalability and how the interaction works, how the interaction with the data store works is something we talk about as well, like volumes as a concept or dedicated services um, for that one. Um, but this way would, will allow you basically to scale up and down based on demand. If we use an example, um, is um, um, or, yeah, that, that, in fact, and that's entirely what cloud services are really about: the scalability effect, the elasticity. I just referred to a, a classical example is web shops in uh, during holiday season, right? So think Christmas season. Suddenly you have a demand in a, um, a, a Amazon or bookstore or wherever else, or let's say more generally, Corona season. Uh, suddenly you have uh, increased demand on online uh, um, um, services and so on. Um, and they will just need to be able to kind of, uh, yeah, Black Friday by Xshop. That's right. That's a good example. Uh, they kind of need to be able to respond to the increased number of requests suddenly, right? And they can't just do that by uh, going to, uh, you know, um, go, go, well, they could possibly, but uh, by ordering yet another set of servers, uh, setting them up just for Black Friday, um, yeah, Black Friday, and removing them on Monday or rather Tuesday, because most likely there's another uh, sale on Mondays anyway. Um, uh, so it wouldn't make sense. The investment wouldn't make sense only for that period. So the idea is there, can we scale up in, uh, during those high demands, right? Christmas period, those sales or whatever it would be, and just have additional instances um, in order to satisfy the increased demand that people have, right? So, and um, especially if it's seasonal, then it's very attractive to have a kind of demand-oriented uh, scalability of the system, right? So you don't uh, uh, you don't have idling performance. There's nothing worse about idling performance, but the idea is to make as much use um, of the um, processing capability that you kind of bought, right? If you have servers, you want to have them as reasonably high load. Otherwise, you just have them use power effectively without having much, you know, profit turnover and return. We always need to think in terms of the objectives of the procuring company, right? So being extra power or uh, uh, um, uh, Hunton or whoever else, right? So um, whatever they run, they just want to make use of the uh, metal they actually have. So, and if they can't do that, or if it's seasonal uh, variations is too strong, then it's quite useful to kind of outsource it, right? So, and get as, as much performance uh, online as possible um, in, instead of uh, keeping this in-house. And then it makes sense for uh, companies like that to basically outsource their um, services. So, so much about scalability, um, uh, the pay-as-you-go model or pay-on-demand you know, pay, um, model. And it has a lot of um, advantages, of course, that, you, uh, that, that you'll... Um, have already observed and we have already discussed. So, um, so some of the three or the three acronyms that you kind of want to um, internalize if you haven't already. Uh, just want to uh, reinforce here is software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. 
um, generally I like to do this uh, in, in kind of a live session, discuss it a bit. Does anyone want to put a finger out in and say what, for example, software as a service means, for example, in contrast to the other two or one of the other two, if you like, either by speaking up or in the chat? I know it's a bit more tedious than it would be in a, in a real setting, but it's um, because I think most of you have the right intuitions already built. Exactly. So there's some good examples. So um, Carol suggested it's like it's Office 365 in the cloud. That's right. Uh, Office is software as a service. Well, nowadays, right, if it's subscription based, that's right, like Adobe. That's right. If you want to use uh, Adobe Designer and so on, you kind of need to subscribe nowadays, right? You can't procure the software package anymore. Um, and we do that as well as university, right? So you all have Office 365 um, as a student that's uh, mapped to your email address that you get from NTNU, right? So what we basically do, we do demand size scaling as well, right? If you have more students in, in one year, then uh, I guess what? We make more use of Office 365. If you have less, we do less, all right? So but it doesn't require us to kind of provide additional servers uh, uh, in advance to kind of uh, scale up or down the system. So that's right. So software as a service is basically focusing on uh, direct user interaction. So the idea is there that it's merely, you merely kind of merely need a browser. That's basically kind of the metaphor you want to use. And from within, um, um, from, from within this, you can basically interact with the software directly. There may be some crude um, scripting opportunities or configuration opportunities that you can automate, of course. But fundamentally, the primary focus here is to facilitate interaction uh, with the browser. It is, uh, as is, the, the idea is that, um, your provider, uh, well, Office in this example, or Adobe and others, uh, provides the entire experience and you just use it um, more or less with minor opportunities for modification uh, or need for modification. So um, platform as a service. Does anyone have any experiences? I mean, you talked about it intuitive last time. Yeah, that's right. Um, Dennis uh, puts in uh, like a uh, Firebase. That's a very good point. Yeah. So that's definitely amongst uh, uh, one example of platform as a service. Yeah. Um, and the new platform or students. Um, yeah. You, I need to think about this more because I'm not, I'm not sure entirely what that entails for all our students. I currently have more the impression that it's more like a SaaS product, that basically collation of different software services. People use Heroku, there you go. Facebook in uh, touristing. I think there's put this, put, put this more in the, in the SaaS category. So software as a service, because you, you, you interacting with it using the browser primarily, right? By, by clicking and so on. Uh, does Facebook allow some sort of scripting? To be honest, I'm not too aware because I don't have a active Facebook account. I shouldn't say that. Um, so, uh, so Facebook is probably more on the SaaS side. Heroku is definitely on the platform side. We get to that. Uh, GitHub, there's a question about GitHub. Um, b -b 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 yeah, to some extent, that's right, because GitHub has GitHub Actions, as far as I understand. You can deploy uh, um, some, some, some executables there in the meantime. Um, it kind of sits in between, I guess. In fact, many of them sit in between. Azure, yeah. So Azure, uh, that's like you 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 have um, kind of a, um, a bit of a silver bullet like AWS because they um, support uh, past services, but they also support um, IS service. MySpace, uh, MySpace be past MySpace. You mean the social network, I believe. I'm not sure if it's still running. Um, in fact, I hadn't looked at it. Uh, for some time. Um, even that, I don't. So um, I would still put this in the as a social network. Would put uh, still would put this into the software as a service category because you interact with this directly. So let me let me let me draw the linkages to past services um, as as we understand them in the context of the. Um, 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 a cloud computing course more generally. So uh, whereas uh, SaaS services focuses on the user, but basically in everything, like everything is managed by the provider. The idea that in a platform as a service is that uh, everything, um, uh, well, you, that 
the, 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 the hardware is largely managed, including the operating system, but you are de facto able and, 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 and including operating system and execution frameworks. I'll give some examples in a second, uh, or make it clearer in a second. And everything on top you can deploy. So you're able to deploy some software, executable software, like your Go code, PHP code, for example, if they provide de facto a running, let's say, um, uh, you know, PHP um, server or something akin to this one. Uh, or patch server, then you, uh, uh, you then you can uh, deploy your um, you know um, executable code there, and similarly for for Go code. So you would need, not need to, for example, install the operating system. You would not need to install the Go environment. You just need to well, kind of you know take what they have or accept what they have, and hope it runs with your code. Well, you kind of want to test it that it runs with your code, of course, and but merely then focus on the code development and deploying this on their system, and then all the rest. Scalability uh, uh, and so on, and 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 and, and, and uh, idling time before switching off your service, and all those kind of things, are so then supposed to be managed by this. So this is very popular or interesting for uh, applications that have a application uh, specific or dedicated programming language or scripting language, where you can uh, kind of uh, write in an application specific uh, language like SAP, the Enterprise Resource Planning System, if you know that, has a dedicated programming language, and basically what you can do is you can program in there and run then in uh, the existing uh, platform in a wider sense but you're not starting from scratch you're not you're not um, uh, uh, you know it assumes the running software uh, uh, in the first place so the the kind of it's a question about who manages what fundamentally and then there's uh, in the extreme case uh, IIS which is really infrastructure as a service the, the idea is you do everything right so you 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 basically just say hey I'm happy to pay for everything but please let it be run elsewhere, but I'm also managing it uh, um, uh, myself, right? So that's that's the key idea of three principles. I get back to that in a second, so uh, bear with me. But before we get there, let me just ask the following question, the, the underlying technology that we need to think about. What are the key technologies? And I'll ask that again and again and again. And if you feel like I'm, I'm repeating myself because uh, I'm, I'm um, suffering from dementia, it's not quite the case. I'm actually doing this by intent because it's very important that we get this really settled in. What is the underlying technology? We talked about some of them right now. You had a lot of examples, in fact, but what is the principal uh, um, technological principles that we really need to think about when we talk about um, cloud computing in its different flavors? Virtualization, that's right. Yeah, virtualization is the absolute key in um, thinking about it. Other aspects? And that's related, of course, but um, uh, something I just want to also have called out explicitly. Virtualization is one, the other one. Storage is, yeah, part of it. In addition to storage, what else? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, that's right. So um, networking, right, is a key feature, of course, of cloud computing, right? Because we need to think about the endpoints. If you think about computers, right, you have a server with an endpoint, runs a given software, and you know uh, accepts requests, responses, and so on. So you think primarily in terms of processing and storage, right? So which likely, at least in our intuitive understanding, can think about you know, having a remote server there that does something. But the key is one of the, uh, the, the one of the keys is the connectivity, of course, right? Because it's not only about uh, scaling up and having a large number of servers, but also having a uh, sufficiently scalable uh, network infrastructure that supports this, right? So, I mean, um, part of the reason why we didn't have cloud computing earlier is not so much the lack of availability of computers, but rather the lack of availability of, of uh, broadband at a scale that we have it now, right? So, I mean, uh, Norway is always ahead of things a bit, but you need to think at, at large, it only makes sense to set, you know, rely on cloud services if you actually have the performance to support them. If you're managing, if you're, for example, thinking that you are running the um, uh, user management, so the directory of an entire company, for example, off-site, meaning like with Microsoft, for example, or in a dedicated data center, you really want to ensure that you have a network connectivity to kind of uh, allow them to sign up at eight o'clock in the morning or whenever they start their work and so on, right? So you need to plan for peak times. And that's where networking is incredibly important. So it's not just about having a lot of hardware there, but it's also about having the necessary connectivity. We'll talk about that a bit, but less, certainly less, because not a networking uh, degree and or course here, to some extent, unfortunately, but in any case, it's not. But we talk a bit more about virtualization um, because it's at the heart of this course. The course is 
naturally geared to it. So uh, repeating, what is what is going to be virtualized? So we had uh, a few things mentioned here already. So we have um, three things that are virtualized fundamentally as part of this process. And I think I'll just pick up on what you're saying. Here. So, yep, CPU, exactly. And then you already said networking before. That's also virtualized. Um, uh, and how far, we'll see. And uh, Carl said um, the third one, which is storage. So those are the main ones that we want to think about, right? So um, when we talk about virtualized, you would say, hey, hang on, isn't there way more that's virtualized as well, right? I mean, you think about the RAM and you know the memory aspects and so on. Uh, well, the idea is, yeah, of course, yes. Um, but uh, the um, thought is that the virtualization of those components can happen to some extent independently. Right. So where we think about a, a computer or even your virtual machine, you think about it as something that is complete and self-contained, like a mini CPU in software, right? So including your uh, CPU, your RAM, your storage and everything, networking interfaces and everything attached to it. But the idea is in the, in the, in the cloud context, the cloud computing, it's very important to dissociate those. So you have dedicated uh, facilities, um, you know, just for processing, for for number crunching, uh, and and so on. Uh, one of you made a reference earlier about um, the, um, for example, you can rent GPUs to do, you know, rendering in AI and so on. Um, that just dedicated for a purpose, um, but it's completely it may be completely dissociated from storage, because uh, sometimes it may well be that you have a machine uh, or you need an extensive amount of processing, but next to no storage. Or conversely, you only need storage but no processing, right? So you want to be able to abstract there as well, and also make it uh, make it possible to flexibly extend one without affecting the other directly, right? So um, when we think about virtualization, the, the, uh, we treat those few things as distinct. And when you think about virtualization of networking. What I'm referring to here is not so much uh, uh, what I meant earlier with the distributed uh, um, uh, communication and networking in that context, which is more like focused on bandwidths and provider availabilities. But when I'm thinking about this here, it's really more about virtualizing complete network infrastructure. Yeah? Think about routers, switches, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, and um, uh, uh, you know, um, subnets uh, and so on. So the basically entire network infrastructure that you would conventionally find in hardware. I mean, uh, many of you, or uh, I think some of you in any case took an operations course down in the um, Cisco lab um, in, 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 in the A building. And you will probably remember, you know, how much um, um, uh, patching you had to do in order to kind of, you know, get something going. It's still, in essence, anyone who hasn't seen it, it's a room full of switches, right? So, um, and the idea is basically there that you learn how to um, set up networks uh, from from a hardware perspective uh, with all those characteristics, you know, subnets, uh, um, uh, demilitarized zones, you know, particularly uh, safeguarded, um, isolated machines, if you like, um, routing, bridging. I'm not sure what else they do, but a lot of different exercises when it's about setting up infrastructure uh, at the base. But the idea is, can we also do that in software, right? So this is distinct from the bandwidth problem. This is really more like the network uh, configuration at the end point. So basically uh, uh, the final, uh, the, 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 the configuration, yeah, in as far as relevant for your setup. And with those three components, that's the key. You have more or less a data center at your, at your hand. Yeah, so that's the metaphor that you want to use. So it's no longer thinking about, oh, one virtual machine, you know, with a dedicated networking card with dedicated storage. No, it's a network of N virtual machines, if you like best and then possibly with shared memory uh, or shared storage uh, um, or individualized storage doesn't matter you can configure it all the way you want but uh, fundamentally it's three distinct aspects that you kind of compose in order to um, uh, model your, your your environment so it's no longer renting a dedicated server right that runs somewhere else which would have been the a way to go, um, I guess, um, 15 to 10 years ago. And this realm, but that was uh, kind of uh, the idea, having a dedicated server for your execution. Then they got around providing more and more V hosts, virtual, virtualized hosts, which actually, you know, the idea is that you can, um, uh, um, um, you, you save costs by actually sharing machines and so on. And um, this decomposition has uh, grown further and even further to an extent that you have may not even know anymore which hardware your particular instance runs on at a given point in time. So um, this decomposition has 
uh, moved on quite a bit. We'll learn more, more, a bit more about, at least conceptually, about the architectures that analyze those systems to get a better understanding. But I just want to motivate this here that it's sufficiently clear. So um, you think about, you can think about it pools of processors. You can think about it as uh, storage pools and, um, and, and and network connectivity that can be dynamically composed and recomposed for particular purposes. Um, so, ah, good one. Uh, so we, we, the other aspect is um, why, so this is of course important for you to be flexible in terms of uh, managing your demands um, in as far as your, your, your data center is concerned uh, or your, your service is concerned, but why is this attractive for a cloud provider? Or why do they want this high level of virtualization? Why don't they just want you know, 500 virtual machines or in the worst case, 500 servers, and they provide one to you, one to the next one, you know, yeah, and they put a bit more RAM in on, add a bit more storage and so on. But why do they completely want to virtualize the environment? Exactly. So CMS, the answer is, it's really about the dynamic allocation, right? Exactly. So Alan puts puts one on top of it. Yeah, the classical over provisioning. So uh, I, I, this is one of those times uh, where I really um, regret that we have a digital interaction because it would be so good in the classroom right now. Uh, because Alan put the kind of finger on it. Um, so first of all, Cole, there's the, there's of course the idea of dynamically allocating, right? So if you, if you now need a bit more RAM. There you go, you have it, right? Or more processing power, but you don't need it in five minutes, so then it's good, then I can scale it back, right? So there's this flexibility. Your, your VMs are hard-coded, right? So you know how many CPUs you have, how much RAM you have, and all that kind of jazz. So that's more flexible in those environments. But but Alan's comment puts, a, puts the point on it, they can sell more than they have. And that's precisely right. By accounting for the fact that you are uh, not in all instances operate at peak uh, um, um, requests, right? So that you have some sort of idling, uh, or, or, or let's say, um, if you have, uh, if you buy or subscribe to, let's say, eight, I don't, know, sixteen gig of RAM and so on, which you probably need towards your average peak time daily and so on. Um, and you, you have made uh, created your, your your own VM and an IIS infrastructure and so on. The uh, in practice you will likely not make this use the whole day, right? And um, the owner of the data, AWS or um, Google Cloud Computing or Azure, Microsoft or uh, whoever else, they can actually monitor this and see what's the actual usage usage on your um, of, of your capacity. And then if, if you don't make use of it, they can reallocate this dynamically. And as soon as you need it, again, uh, they're probably, of course, immediately reallocate, so you wouldn't even notice. But what they can do is fundamentally what's called over-provision. So they can sell more capacity than they actually have because they assume that they're clever and um, well quick enough to reallocate capacity, be it on processing, storage, or uh, with related to networking, based on demand. So it does not occur as if you are uh, um, uh, you know, under provision. So uh, the idea is that we hardly lose and use anything. And the same will happen in this very course. Later in the course, will all of you will get an account uh, uh, for for uh, 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 OpenStack, which is uh, locally hosted. And some of you will know it's some locally hosted cloud environment. Um, and uh, it's the same thing there. De facto, will probably you know, over provision you massively, we give you way too much resources, way more resources you can possibly use, and perhaps even too much resource, too many, too much resources, uh, in in the sense that if we were to use all those resources concurrently in the class only, that we probably would uh, challenge uh, the infrastructure down there, right? So, um, but in practice, it will never be the case that we all use our resources to a limit, right? So we over over uh, they over provision and we over subscribe by uh, by by default and this is where it becomes very very handy and then then it also makes sense why those data centers are always so massive and accumulate so many customers um, because by sharing resources about many uh, um, um, uh, um, customers clients as they, as they refer to them um, they have uh, those effects grow stronger right this under usage under usage um, and dynamic uh, allocation needs and so on and um, Based on this, they will be able to actually provide your performance when you need it, and uh, over provision uh, more or less continuously. It will be a rare instance that they feel that they're running out of capacity. But even if that's the case, they hopefully have a second data center coming back to networking, and they will dy dynamically reroute and reinstantiate your entire infrastructure in a different data center. You wouldn't even know. Um, but again, this relies on the 
um, uh, on the um, um, capacity in terms of networking, right? Connectivity. So that's why networking and uh, broadband capability and connectivity is such an important factor nowadays from a competitiveness point of view, right? So that many countries fight for, uh, you know, investments based on the um, their uh, digital connectivity, effectively. So. Um, all right, uh, I think, yeah, I'm running over time. Um, uh, in, in sense of break, you probably want to break. Is that correct? Because I'm talking a lot, I think. Yes, you need a break. You're, it's completely sane, I agree, especially in the setting. So quarter past, is that a uh, compromise we can work with? I'm not sure what kind of breaks you're used to. You are the, I think I, I got a yes from this. So let's do quarter past for now. Um, but feel free to voice your chat in your opinions. You prefer 15 minutes break? That's um, okay. Um, so, in, in the interest of time, it would be good probably to start at sixteen fifteen. I bear in mind, however, that I plan for a more fifteen minutes break if that's okay. Okay, I see. Okay, I didn't know that. So, usually we have a standard of five to ten minutes, or had in the past. Um, but allow me to keep it to sixteen fifteen uh, for now. So, I have a, because I want to get through some aspects, and then next week I'll be more. Um, yeah, thanks. Accommodating. Okay, welcome back. Um, so one of the aspects, aspects I just want to get it really across that we don't confuse those two. Right earlier, I asked for um, the fundamental technology that underlies cloud computing, right? So, and you guys rightly got at um, uh, virtualization, right? So um, that's that's the main point there. So, um, but it's important to distinguish, distinguish those uh, explicitly, right? So we should not confuse them. One being the technology that is used to kind of um, you know, create and manage data in the widest sense. When we think about data as output and input of our activity, you know, we use processing powers, uh, storage, and so on. But fundamentally, it's pro about processing and delivering data. And um, cloud computing should be understood more as the provision of uh, services based on those data, right? So that's that's the kind of the, the higher level um, um, perspective there. So how is this bundled up, you know, like combining, let's say, um, virtualization of storage, processing, and networking into a service, you know, on, on different levels. So um, that may well be infrastructure level, uh, platform, or um, software level, as we, as we just, as you guys uh, already uh, picked up on correctly. Um, so just to reiterate some some of the opportunities, and again, this is more like a reflection on what we kind of um, talked slash chatted about already. Um, but perhaps it's just to, to make it really clear and um, explicit and feel free to to inject at any time perhaps you have other ideas um, that, that that should be find better reflection or contextualize this more accurately so uh, again on the on the there when we talk about computer cloud computing should realize that there are opportunities on many sides so it's not just one one sided deal saying oh the 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 consumers do better the clients do better because they have this flexibility if you like but there's uh, simply it's building on a first of all the vendor side opportunities right so on uh, amazon's opportunities on on google's and uh, uh, microsoft's uh, opportunity for mostly so and the idea is that basically that you have this multi-tenancy effect, right? So you can host multiple clients and therefore you have this uh, um, 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 uh, underutilization of resources um, that are provisioned already. So you can have this um, um, elasticity effect that you basically can uh, assume and hope that there are different loads on different sides. The other, the other aspect I didn't mention yet, which is really plays into it as well, is um, the... Uh, um, the balancing effect of having um, different services uh, provided in different um, time zones and regions, right? So, if, for example, Azure, um, yeah. So, if, if, if uh, um, yeah, Azure or any of those big ones doesn't really matter, provide services. There's also balancing factor um, um, in, in in terms of the utilization based on uh, daytime effects, uh, possibly, right? So, the need for offloading. So, for example, if it's uh, um, um, nighttime um, at, in, in certain regions on the planet, there's daytime elsewhere, and there, there's kind of those overlapping uh, situations where it basically means that there's less use from a particular clientele and more use from another one, which balances each other out. But the problem is there, there is also a connectivity challenge there. If you need to have uh, low latency connectivity, then you would want to seek a data center that's in your region in the first place. So that may actually uh, remove some of those effects. 
But um, so uh, by coming back to that point here, multi-tenancy, so the effect is there, uh, you know, you have multiple people, therefore you can easily provision. Um, the idea is also that uh, you have a certain uh, robustness of the infrastructure. Um, so um, uh, what does that mean? Well, when we talk about robustness, you think can think about specialization um, of the vendor, right? So because they will think about, or they will have the necessary staff expertise um, and so on to run those services safely and reliably. Um, and that's becoming more and more important in, 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 in a nowadays setting where it's no longer feasible effectively to run your single server and really uh, to to ensure, you know, with the sufficient certainty that you're actually doing a good job by catering, both having the, uh, uh, um, um, you know, performing development and provision of services, but also their hosting and security associated with this, right? So being able to offload this uh, to, to someone else, uh, and hence someone uh, mentioned earlier security as a service, is of course a brilliant idea and opportunity there as well, right? So you want to get rid of um, this responsibility to some extent, because with responsibility comes also liability. It's another aspect, right? So you are you can be held responsible for certain outages, especially if you are, as a developer even, uh, you know, developing for a third party and providing your service as a service to them, but in, in turn relying on AWS or elsewhere, then you may be bound contractually to provide a certain uptime, for example, right? And you can offload this part of the risks uh, to your own vendor, that being AWS, for example. So uh, we'll talk a bit more about SLAs as well later in the course because it's a term or concept you want to be acquainted with also if you're ever in a position to design one or to sign one, worst case. Um, um, then you want better know what, you know, you better want to know what should be in there, what you want to look out for. So, um, so the robustness aspect and then the other aspect is the ecosystem effect. That is, um, given that, you know, increasingly num a number of um, companies, corporations, organizations in the widest sense use cloud services, um, makes it very easy also to combine and um, compose new um, services um, based based on those, right? So the, the idea is that you can shift from being actually the, the service provider to a service composition um, or composer in a widest sense or coordinator that you yourself not necessarily provide all the data centric and processing centric services that you, uh, you need to you need to have in order to provide your uh, um, you know added added value as part of your API that you're exposing but you can use others as well basically right so we have a element of first of all data decomposition across different services second of all we have shared uh, interaction protocols right so and we'll talk a bit about, more about those for example rest is a very prominent one that will exploit heavily throughout the course where you are actually able to um, tie your own service that you provide um, um, into other services that exist already in the system, right? So sometimes it's not so much about providing uh, data per se, but rather cleverly composing those. And those ecosystems affect actually uh, um, 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 accumulate um, in, in a cloud environment where everything is properly provided. Um, so on the user side, uh, very pragmatic opportunities, which are really like uh, something that's um, um, I think un to some extent has been under discussed, but I think overutilized talking about it because many people have missed use of this, but it's uh, the kind of uh, democratization of innovation. What does it mean? Well, it means that um, the threshold for engaging, providing new and innovative services becomes very, very low, right? You as uh, now, what is it? Uh, fourth semester bachelor students, I believe, right? Uh, on average in any case, um, you are as, um, as, as, as geared to provide, you know, innovative services as anyone else out there because for you it's just a matter of signing up for that account and suddenly, in best case, you have a data center at your avail, right? So and if your clever idea doesn't work out in one or two months, you switch this whole thing off and there's no remnants of server running, uh, standing in your bedroom or wherever else. You don't have an upfront investment of hundreds or uh, perhaps even thousands of uh, uh, well, in terms of Krona, most certainly thousands of Krona. Um, but uh, in, in case of in, in, when, when you rely on those uh, services, it's very easy for you to just switch it off and forget about this and so on and move on. So it makes uh, democratic uh, or innovation rather cheap, at least initially. Um, we talk about pricing more of cloud systems because, um, of course, there is, there is another uh, challenge attached to it. Um, but in any case, the entry bar for providing new services to anyone else is really, really, really uh, low. Um, so um, 
Yeah. So what's what's the downside perhaps if anyone wants to um i mean we make the access entry access bar quite low but what's the other challenge that we are actually exposing us to um when we rely on cloud services as a, let's say individual company or whatever else whatever challenges security is one yeah that's right so uh, uh, yeah security is one uh it's a very good point uh in in, in practice um However, we increasingly get the impression uh, that said that's it's. Uh, I think it would be nice to have an empirical study on this one. We increasingly get the impression uh, that uh, security may well be better managed by the cloud providers than by us, on average, when we look at the average skill level. Uh, then another point is redundancy and safety of your files. So that's definitely a big one. Um, I mean. It's right. I mean, if you think about this one, at least the facilities to provide backup and uh, 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 redundancy are uh, uh, provided. Whether you use them and pay for them is a different story, but because usually those are also paid services. Yeah. Um, service availability, uptime, clearly, absolute yes. There's no way you can get close to um, um, uh, uh, their service pr provision, but um, if it's down, it's down, right? So you don't have any control. Um, downside, overseas law and privacy. Yeah, that's a biggie. Yes, Jung Gunnar, that's correct. So that's a that's a big deal. We need to think about this as well, right? So we in 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 in, in um, the EA and uh, EU have um, certain obligations to be particularly mindful if we, uh, especially involving uh, European users, in any of our services with respect to privacy, right? So it's uh kind of challenging we'll probably talk about the legal implication and political implications of the um uh, privacy shield um arrangement with the us that had in the past at least allowed us to um provide um, um private information uh, or a store rather um information of eu residents in the us i'm not sure if um, that is has been challenged legally and we'll see what comes next so um basically the idea is that we ideally need to host something locally right so for example, for Office 365, that's why you find us using this more than, for example, Google in many instances, uh, we uh, have, have at least the contextual reassurance that it's hosted uh, in Europe and uh, I think even in Norway, at least a relevant service. And therefore, it's compliant with GDPR. Um, and therefore, we can use it as an institution. So it has been a bit bit of a change and uh, shift uh, there in terms of the, the policy. So a lot of services um, are actually, technically, we're not allowed to use those in the context of uh, teaching, especially if they afford you or require you to sign up for something or sign into something. If it's just a providing our data to you, that's OK, it's our problem, right? So if um, providing streaming service and so on, that's um, I'm exposing my data, not yours. Um, there are gray areas. Okay, um, very good point, uh, Jung Gunnar. You definitely, outla you guys <laughs> pretty much outlined the kind of uh, uh, important aspects of discussion in the later part of the course. Um, so the other aspect from the user side opportunity, due to the scaling, we can actually get kind of a more um, accommodation of uh, customized um, experiences, right? So. Uh, while you know the earlier websites were completely uniform in, in structure, right? So everyone would see the same. They would even see the same ads, possibly, and uh, you know, same layout structure and recommendations, all that kind of jazz. Uh, cloud services just made it a lot easier. First of all, to uh, use third-party services to uh, you know perform. Uh, some sort of uh, number crunching on your data, like on your customer data or whatever else, in order to provide recommendations. You know, similar to the, you know, early, that was usually referred to as the the, the main u early use case for this. Uh, the recommendation system is Amazon, right? Based on uh, past pur purchases of similar customers, what would Amazon recommend to you, for example? And um, this has been increasingly becoming important for even uh, small scale websites. So you can't. Just no longer assume only big players need to do this. No, you as a um, um, entry level participant will also need to be more open to um, providing personal experiences, and that also applies to web services um, in many instances. Um, yeah, collaboration and robust user experience. I guess yeah, good. Those are opportunities um, that are. Um, quite sensible. We, we pointed those out earlier already that we can thrive on this ecosystem uh, effects that is um, both from a vendor side and user side. But fundamentally, it's important to see what the what the economic benefits on the vendor side are and the new opportunities on the user side. I think that's the main part to, to play up here um, specifically. And that is the service perspective. The other aspect is um, the 
um, varying perspective on cloud computing. If you don't talk to different people, you get different responses to what it is and what's important in it. So and that's something you want to know as well, that in, in part you yourself come from different backgrounds with your uh, degrees and specializations, uh, which is good. Um, but it's also important for all of you to be aware what the difference perspectives, you know, well, what implications those have and, you know, how other people see it. And it also helps you to identify which, you know, uh, where they're coming from in a way, right? So which perspective they're coming from based on their view on cloud uh, computing specifically, right? So from a business perspective, and that's what it kind of unfortunately in many instances boils down to, it's about profit maximization, right? How do I squeeze the most about my, out of my infrastructure? Uh, and that means, you know, how can I have, uh, satisfy the highest number of customers by minimizing the cost? Uh, so from a business perspective, scalability is in inherently attractive, right? So if you think about seasonal effects and things like this uh, and customization effects, which often uh, requires additional processing capability um, to identify, for example, personas out of uh, data and so on and provide corresponding recommendations. And the other aspect is reliability. So uh, you kind of want to do the, you know, offload the heavy lifting, the IT, uh, which just costs money as per narrative in, in organizational settings often, uh, outsource this entirely where possible, um, because then you can control the cost and bring it down to one number effectively. Um, whether this is always successful is a good question. I mean, we have instances already where publish that people start insourcing in for various reasons into their own companies, especially if they're sufficiently large, not for small ones, but for sufficiently large ones. But fundamentally, those are general motivations that uh, point in favor of cloud computing if you look at it from a business perspective. From an admin perspective, it's um, a changing skill sets. So uh, moving away from primarily running, you know, and uh, 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 so sort of from any hardware centric activity, which was always part of the admin's perspective when it con configured systems and the expertise they had built uh, uh, over years to a, um, you know, a configuration role, right? So um, um, many of the courses nowadays will not actually focus on hardware anymore. In fact, many admins nowadays, uh, in fact, newcoming admins may not actually see or interact it. Uh, with hardware and their own server systems at all anymore. But it's really about building and deploying systems as well. Uh, uh, software configuration management is a big deal. Virtualization, of course, comes with this. And it's more, uh, again, towards you know scripting a data center than actually building a data center or uh, programming a data center. So the skill set that uh, sysadmins had been, had had, um, you know, let's say, yeah, 10, 15 years back was very different from the one that you will, uh, the profiles you're looking at uh, nowadays, right? So this, this interaction with those environments has become, um, uh, based on programming has become the central notion here. So that's the other perspective. So if you want to set up your entire data center. Uh, again, there's a course um, offered by, Eek, was it Infrastructure as Code? Um, I think, um, uh, or similar to that. So basically the, the idea is there that this is, pretty much the dedicated objective here, you know, how to set up a data center just, you know, by scripts, basically in one click setting, ideally. And we as a, well, we carefully here, but as a programmer, and uh, there's a considerable uh, fraction of us that sees themselves as programmer, uh, I think that's uh, the dominant perspective that we have here is that we are thinking about using, but also providing uh, cloud services, right? So we're not programming a data center, but we're using a data center, but so we better understand how it, roughly works what we need to do in order to interact. But what we want to do is to kind of be the intermediator between the, 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 the data center and uh, use it um, to actually deploy our services that are of value to the business. And of course, um, you know, respond to some user and so on, right? So that's the third perspective that one can have. It's important to recognize this um, because uh, otherwise you will, um, uh, may oversee certain objectives. Uh, but it also means that uh, we as a programmer, uh, if we want to see ourselves as such, or as system programmers in the widest sense, we always want to see ourselves uh, in terms of the business objectives that's come along with this, right? So profit maximization and reduction of challenges um, due to um, uh, liability and um, exploitation of scalability effects. So for example, we need to learn different technologies such as cloud computing. Um, okay, for us, what does it mean? Well, you know, um, we'll be extensively dealing in this course with APIs. So it's one our main business and uh, specifically kind of cloud APIs, of course, uh, generally in terms of REST standards um, or REST specification, uh, as you will see. And we use those in order to uh, conceive of our own new services, right? So if 
our competence is in data collection and we had data and so on, those could of course be the basis for providing services, but realistically will um, compose um, a new service based on existing ones. Uh, and this will be the activity that we're largely engaging in, of course, including the um, deployment to, to, to a certain extent, because this interaction between deployment programming has become in, uh, e increasingly immediate or intimate, if you like, uh, even though you can still have different perspectives on the same thing. Right. So, um, okay, what does it mean for us? Well, cloud programming is really about the, the, you know, using other vendors' APIs, understanding them, reading specifications, understanding the specification, underlying them, um, and developing our own services and designing APIs and implementing them. So that's pretty much the whole scope, uh, including the deployment, which I probably should call out as well. Um, yeah. So that's that's the main that's the general main motivation that I, I seed for the uh, want to seed for the uh, cloud cloud computing more generally so we know where we are what we're doing what we're likely not doing because um, uh, um, it, it, otherwise we would quickly kind of run in um, conflict with other um, papers that are offers courses that are offered here uh, as part of uh, some degree at, at NTNU, for example. So um, we have the programmer perspective in many instances, but we're very open, especially in the project to also have other kind of, um, if, for example, I know that uh, um, one thing that comes with interdisciplinary courses is very different orientations. So I'm very aware that some of you will have a deeper background in certain aspects such as infrastructure and so on. Uh, and you're more than welcome to play those up and use them to your advantage in the projects, right? So, you know, by no means coerced into a um, particular perspective, uh, but for the assignments we will kind of um, ensure that there's some more on the programming side in, in, in most respects. So the last aspect, I really want to make one thing clear about the technology and the different as a service conceptions. Um, I think it has helped people to get a better substantive understanding in the past. And um, this is the cloud computing stack. Basically, what every, every time we talk cloud computing, we need to think about a few things. First of all, what are the components that we need to work with? Um, if you think about a service that's provided and who manages what, that's the main point, right? So it's, it's, uh, that's the, the, the main the key point about, uh, having a, a as a service, uh, conception here and right? who's responsible for what, when we talk about this stack, we generally think about the few aspects, namely, um, storage processing and networking, right? So those, those two bottom ones, which are basically virtualized in the first place, um as a central one on top of this sitting then for example an operating system that's um you know sensibly services associated with this um you know web servers um uh, cont virtualization daemons um, um any sort of other um services that uh, you know applications can be built up on and of course on top of the applications right so and the question is again who manages what if you think about infrastructure as a services like nothing is kind of managed by the provider but they provide the raw resources specifically in terms of network processing and uh, uh storage right and you're building everything on top of it you installing your operating system you installing your web server and other services you need and you installing potential applications right so you you would need to manage all this one and this comes with a bit of uh, heavy lifting because you're also responding for security for example uh, you know uh, running updates and so on ensuring that it's uh, running properly it's supposed to be installing the latest releases for services that you have and so on. so you you assume all the responsibility but also flexibility right you you can literally install anything you can install on your local machine or any other machine really as well uh, in the cloud so that would be infrastructure as a service you basically get a bit of you know uh, virtualized hardware pieces and you can tie them together in terms forms of vms or otherwise and then install conventionally what you need on top of it a bit like your virtual box right now but of course in a more performing environment and with more uh, particular uh, greater networking capabilities because the virtual box is very contrived when it comes to um, that the uh, examples here, you guys knew them already, I think. Uh, we, we talked about them. It's really like Amazon Web Service, AWS, its biggest player, Azure, second biggest player, and Google Compute. Yeah, yeah Google Compute is uh, one of the other players. Um, they actually hold, don't hold that much. Um, so the most important players generally AWS, um, followed by Azure, and then um, others uh, further down the track, including Google. Um, yeah, it's important the differentiation between, or I get to that, the differentiation between a platform as a service and infrastructure. So it's not hard and fast because all those infrastructure as a service provider generally also provide higher level services, at least pass platform as a 
service services well that's one term um but perhaps even uh software as a service services yeah. um so platform as a service the question again who manages what and that's the idea here that um we are actually um relying on the provider to kind of um manage everything including the operating system and to yeah it's, it's fuzzy boundaries there of course to some extent the services that run on top of it as well right so but we are more flexible and actually um kind of uh, uh, deploying modifying configuring services some in some instances some instances less so so this is not a hard line here but it could actually entail certain elements of services especially if they run um runtime environments for certain um, um, software and so on but fundamentally the idea is that you don't kind of deal with the vm business in sense of you install the operating system or something like this you get some sort of entry point where you can upload your code and it just executes magically right that's the main point there so they provide the platform for execution within certain constraints related to scalability, pricing models, uh, but also, uh, you know, versions of uh, um, software or perhaps even only supported programming languages. You may not be able to run everything uh, everywhere, right? So um, this is platform as a service. And Heroku is uh, one example. The Google App Engine is another example, uh, another um, uh, example of a particular kind here. That's an interesting one just to play it up a bit. And we come back to this later on when we do implementation on um, 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 past services, so platform as a service environments, because that will be your first exercise, or not exercise, but your first um, 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 assignment activity in any case um, to deploy something on Heroku. And what you'll find that you will need to accommodate, uh, and Siamak will talk about this uh, later on in the semester, um, if you need to accommodate the specific um, characteristics, right? So you need to have additional configuration files, you uh, need to organize uh, projects in a certain manner and so on. There's certain assumptions that you suddenly impose, that are imposed on you that you need to commit to, otherwise your code doesn't run, right? In infrastructure as a service environment, it's quite different because you define what runs and how it's run, how it's configured and so on, right? So there's a certain buy-in. And Google App Engine makes it slightly worse and that's an understatement quite a bit worse um because you cannot even use um um for example if you write uh, web services you can't use the standard google packages or, yeah uh, golang packages in many instances anymore but you actually need to use customized ones specifically provided by google so they're optimized the, the google app engine right so uh, presumably the advantages lie in responsiveness and optimization and and so on that that they can do in the background but what it means yeah, is a lock in effect right so what the code you're writing is no longer as independent as you would think it is and as abstracted as it should be but likely your time yourself to the underlying platform a bit more less so in a roku case more so in the google app engine case but you are still developing code so it's very it sounds very convenient from a developer point of view to say hey that's cool i don't need to deal with any of the hardware business let alone operating system let alone software security updates all that i just want to deploy my piece of code and be happy afterwards so uh, and that that's where pass as a service comes in that's good for prototyping specifically and you will get a feel about how this works and then um, as the final one, so again, software as a everything, that's the idea. Everything is managed by the provider, right? So you may be able to configure certain aspects such as your avatar and your email address and may also import, you know, your old emails or documents or whatever else, or, you know, and so you, those things are of course possible, but, um, or perhaps minor rebranding that you have, for example, into a new logo somewhere. But uh, uh, overall, the software is comprehensively managed by the provider. Uh, for, throughout the entire stack advantage for you you just pay for this whole be, uh, thing and that's it so you don't need to do any sort of uh, 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 long-term maintenance there's a certain initial configuration of course but uh, you don't need to deal with the operating system networking services application you just need to say hey i need more of this scalability is not enough or something like this or new services uh, but there's fundamentally no need to maintain and what can be very attractive so and uh, part of your skill or ability hopefully at the end of the course is to decide also when to use what right so in some instances you can afford to use what that means um do you have the capacity the, the manpower in terms of competence and skill to maintain a system uh, or what your objectives are you know what scalability features you need and so on and um but i just want to see this distinction between ias infrastructure as a service uh, PAS or PaaS, I guess is a more correct use, uh, platform as a service and SaaS software as a service. So those are the three 
concepts they want to get across, right? So, and I mean, if you wanted some intuitions about it, it's of course the Google App Suite, if you like that you're using Google Docs, Google Streets and so on, right? So it's all the case that you just use your browser. You can script against it a bit, but you don't need to do any massive setup or let's, let alone any sort of deployment there. Office 365 and things like Salesforce. Salesforce is for um, reporting primarily in the context of um, retail, not retail, but um, um, wholesale, yeah, any sort of, uh, uh, sales um, enterprise um, that is involved with this. Cool. All right. Um, that was basically my 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 pointer about um, the 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 introduction to some cloud services. Now, of course, provide you with this slide set as well. That's. Uh, I just want to ensure that everyone's on the same page when it comes to um, this particular um, aspect. Um, um, the 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 as a service notion and what the advantages and disadvantages are. Those are, of course, also. Um, as, um, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but explicitly all the things we're talking about are, of course, eventually exam relevant, even though they may not show up in the assignment more immediately because we're not asking those things in the assignment. Any questions? There's not much time left, but I have a few more ideas I want to do. We'll get there. Um, ah, question. There we go. Hang on. Pressing white buttons. Need to get this right. Ah, yeah. Where are lecture slides pulled? Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for dealing with this. Yeah, exactly. I just point to the wiki. Uh, if you haven't had the chance uh, to access it, you will need to create your own account using the NTNU student account on GitHub. Uh, GitLab, sorry for that, self um, hosted by us. You need to be approved. And once you're in, you can uh, access request for this wiki that's posted here. And I need to give you mail access. That's all a kind of one shot activity. Once it's done, you're good, but you need to do this. So, um, in fact, see if there's any sort of request I need to respond to right now. In case, yep, there's one. And off we go. So now uh, you have access as well. So, ideally. Okay. Um, in the interest, of uh, time. So I wanted to actually ask a bit about um, Linux specifically because um, I'm, it, it is my task to kind of um, scale down or up depending on needs, uh, what we need to do for um, 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 as part of your Linux, how far you are um, kind of prepared. I asked briefly already and I got a good response in terms of um, uh, general skills and experience in Linux, but I would like to get a bit more feedback if that's possible. Um, with respect to more specific Unix ex Linux experiences. Um, that's not only one question, it's two questions, in fact, but I just want you want to gauge a bit where strengths and weaknesses lie and if people are generally comfortable in certain aspects. And then also later on, I'll ask you what you think would be uh, interested to be exposed to in addition to what you know already. Um, so if you can, I hope you see the number displayed on the top right. You can just go into Menti and briefly indicate your yeah, okay, cool. Oh yeah, cool. Okay, let's see, three people. Let's see how it emerges. Permissions, something you have extensively, it seems, learned about, which is cool. User management, less so, doesn't matter too much anyway. Process management, wow, general command like use, okay. Mm -hmm. File handling, it seems like um, people are largely on track. Because those two aspects that are uh, moderate, like user management, process management, are not that central. Let's get a few more. more more stable here already yeah so file system is deeply settled brilliant permission system sounds good mm. general command bank use file editing and handling um, software installation is uh, mixed probably depends a bit on your experiences with respect to operating systems but I assume you largely use Ubuntu which we do here as well so um, 
feel free to uh, disagree if then cool okay I think it stabilizes there. That sounds, for me, is a good snapshot. Uh, I think I have a really good overview already. So user management is less pronounced, but I don't think it's as super important. Process manager is okay, distribution. Cool. Um, the other aspect is basically, uh, what are the you know features on Linux? And that can be very explicit ones uh, that you feel at least confident about. So I'm not thinking in terms of categories that I have pro proposed there. If you feel like that's something you want to brush up on, is of course something as well. But perhaps there's other aspects, specific topics and so on that you may or may not have heard about, but you feel like, ah, that's not really the kind of uh, topic I would claim myself to be uh, you know, competent in, or at least have the least confidence about uh, to see. Because I get the impression that you guys are very well geared for uh, uh, with respect to the Linux uh, requirements that we have in the first place. So I'm not necessarily feeling uh, challenged. Yeah, most of it, okay. Least confident about. Uh, machine milieu. Yeah, that's definitely something that goes beyond the classical uh, Linux curriculum, process management, software installation, user management. Let's see what it emerges here. Installs without sudo. Yeah, that's a challenging one. Um, so it seems software installation is one topic. It kind of mirrors what we had in the um, previous thing. Okay, process management is something we can talk about. I think it's a good idea. Um, <laughs> I'm 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 impressed to get the. Uh, responses, uh, everything or most of it, where I'm asking about least confident. That's great. Um, because it doesn't necessarily reflect what I saw before. I felt you guys looked very confident uh, or uh, quite confident in all the major areas. So um, I guess then next session we do a bit of a quiz eh, and then see where we need to poke a bit deeper. Um, I see already there is a certain value in looking at process management a bit more, I think. Um, software installation is something I want to brush up on. Um, yeah, everything is a bit of a tough one. Um, Vim is not something that is terribly important for this course, but worthwhile to know. Uh, I'm certain you learn in it uh, about Vim more with Marish. Um, if needed, as part of Golang, he will use it for his SSIDE. Um, what else comes to mind? Piping, yeah, good. Piping is a good one. Um, that's really helpful. We'll briefly go over um, the permissions are settled, it seems. That's great. I love that. Yeah, good. Okay. Cool. Very helpful. Um, bash scripting, I saw already. We're not doing much bash scripting right now when it comes to that uh, point because... Um, I mean, I don't think we have the explicit necessity because um, many of the scripting that we do is probably more happening in Docker files in the end. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. No, I think uh, everything, I mean, we'll not be able to, to go through the entire Linux stack, and we shouldn't because uh, the idea is that all of you have some sort of Linux background, but we can uh, start with certain uh, uh, triggers here. So I'm having in mind right now process management, software installation. Why is it tiny now? Ah, oh, no, it's still there. Software installation and piping seem to be topics that are relevant. I think they're very relevant. Uh, in fact, I think piping is particularly relevant also for the advanced programming course, but I think it's a general skill that's very uh, Linux uh, specific. Um, that said, you have it also in PowerShell. Um, and then we go from there and then see if there are other uncertainties that we could dip deeper in. So I'll try to be reasonably agile next week, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, on this particular topic so we can make it as uh, flexible as possible for you guys. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this, this feedback. I think that's quite uh, representative now having 40 uh, respondents on that one. Um, oh, I should have hovered here, right? Shouldn't it? So, okay. Okay, cool. Are there any other questions or comments uh, right now that you want to get or give that can be more... Um... Ah, exactly, chat. There's a, there's a comment. That's very nice. Um... Ah, yes, that's right. Cool. Um, so uh, there's a question. I have a Linux server without a GUI. Will that suffice for the course? Yes. Clearly, yes. And in fact, 
in the past we had done that, uh, asking people only to install their Linux server, meaning generally Ubuntu server, uh, uh, um, you know, um, 24 LTS or 18.04 LTS, pick one LTS version, uh, do take the 2004 because we're optimized most most of it most of our course I guess against this, uh, but without a GUI is perfectly fine as long as you're comfortable with command line. In fact, I feel generally more comfortable with the command line only and it's the realistic use case because you don't run GUIs in a cloud. It's just not happening generally uh, unless they are um, client relevant like in gaming and so on, right? So, um, bu -bu 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 so um, let's see, that is fine. The other one, they always, oh, that's an interesting one. Um, they, they always seem to be some edge cases for whatever use case you have. As an example, SNET does not seem to work in WSL. Ah, okay, you're referring to the uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, is that correct? I think, um, who was it? And was studying. Yes, so yeah, that's the beast, that thing. Um, so <laughs> I have tried to use it in the past, and it's really great for uh, basic tasks like you know like um, a bit of batch uh, bash not batch bash scripting of course and uh, a bit of uh, commander interaction basic service interaction and so on but they they are um, exactly uh, but the, the the limitations lie generally when it comes to uh, hosting services um, you know, it has kind of a, a pre interface that kind of maps the Windows functionality on, on Linux so you can kind of interact. But when it comes to deployment or uh, binding sockets, at least in WSL 1, the, or, the older one, which is still running my machine, because you need to be on the, what is it, uh, uh, Windows 19 or something like this, right? So um, 19 or 9 or something to have WSL 2 access. Uh, then you couldn't bind ports, so it was not possible to host any services there. So unfortunately, WSL is not optimal for our for for for, for th those activities. Uh, so it can't really substitute a full VM. That's why I'm still encouraging the use of VirtualBox or any other sort of uh, uh, um, dedicated machine you can have access to, of course. Uh, so Windows subsystem for Linux, I actually would appreciate if you guys can try certain things on that thing and, and tell us what doesn't work or what works if in case we have those exercises and so on. Uh, but um, I'm unfortunately not confident that it will you know, sufficient for um, all the things that one would need. But it's something to be aware of. So Windows has a Linux subsystem. If you have it, try to install or activate it rather. You need to do it in the software features in Windows. And I think you also need to, and Alan, you can correct me there uh, or... Um, uh, Andre, um, uh, you need to activate, was it, uh, you need to go into developer ring, right? So you need to be, um, um, activate your, your um, the, the developer updates and then you get access to WSL. And you need to be on a recent uh, Windows, reasonably recent Windows to get WSL2, so Windows subsystem for Linux, which is basically, I should show it briefly to you, is basically, ah, hang on. Yeah, if I want, so basically um, just a there you go there it is a, a command line that runs on uh, Windows but emulates a more or less a um, Linux environment right so it of course runs on a Windows machine but it emulates a, um, a Linux with the full um, kind of layout that you would expect if you have seen Linux before you see the file layout right so you have also access to um, you know a lot of configuration files so you, it really feels like dealing with a real Linux machine but it becomes a bit more challenging when you actually look what's running in the background background and there's not much more running than you know in it basically um, you know the, the basic runtime environment now the bash environment of course and top the very application I'm running at top by the way if you haven't uh, come across it and I believe you have it's just uh, for showing your current processes that are running and if you look at a conventional Linux machine you would see it explodes because you would see a lot of different uh, much more uh, different services that actually run the background so there's a natural limitation of um, um, doing anything. Or here, for example, I'm trying to show uh, connected um, connections, network connections, and it still doesn't isn't able to resolve those. But that said, I'm working on the earlier, older version of WSL uh, because my system hasn't been upgraded yet because that's managed by the institution. Um, cool. Yeah. All right. So a few more administrative courses, um, uh, uh, points that people have. So the lecture does not, this Monday lecture, I assume, does not appear in your weekly schedule, uh, is one comment here that I got. Let me just validate this because this is very important. Um, it should actually, um, hang on, it should actually, it's 
get rid of this. I think I got a good grasp of this. Let's see, let's do a bit of fact finding. Um, because if that's the case, then I need to get in touch with the scheduling team. Because from now on, uh, all Mondays should be dedicated to, um, oh, wrong. this slot should be dedicated to a Monday session. Let's see, let's go for, um, see the whole semester. Because I also need to follow up what's happening there. Now it looks reasonably consistent, right? So it's mostly Monday. No, it's on all instances Monday. Um, Monday, 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 Monday and Wednesday. There's an exception because I think it's around, I don't know right now, probably Easter. Um, no, I think it should be okay in the team of plan. So if you go back to uh, the, pretty much in a way I navigated, you go back to our um uh, environment then you should be able to see this so uh yes we're running it on monday unfortunately i'm not a fan of this to be honest because it's rather late in the day and so on but there's no other way it was um, basically mandated by the um, time planning office because there is a conflict with another um, um course that couldn't be resolved um uh, and there so they shifted us so Okay, you're sorting these things out in the chat right now, in a sense. But if you follow the links that are in the wiki, you should get to the right one, right? So here it's always that one uh, timetable information, um, generally. Um, I try to keep everything in this wiki as a central point. Okay. Um... Yeah, no comments by Thomas. Ubuntu for Windows only works great if only a CLI, exactly. If only if a command line device is needed, that's fine. If you need to run services, however, applications, software packages, and so on, then it becomes a bit more, well, you can actually, but if it's, yeah, it's dedicated services, such as a web service or something, then it becomes uh, tricky, or SSH service. Even. Okay. Um, so, um, I, I saw someone who is, uh, says it does not appear for him in, um, in the team plan, so the, Again, uh, the only thing I can offer is to navigate, navigate from here. If you're in a special case and you're not a BPROC student or a BData student, then it may be associated with that. In this case, I would encourage you to uh, get in touch with me and we need to sort this out as to why this is not a sh showing up for you. Uh, one comment, um, with XRDP, you can also have a GUI. Of course you can, yes. You can, of course, host a GUI. And there's absolutely no, 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 no question there, um, but it's just not, you know, you shouldn't have it if you don't need it because CLI is simply more efficient. We'll talk about this as a trade-off as well. Um, another comment was the um, Golan course was being held in which subject to be clear? Yes, that's right. Uh, I'll write a, a dedicated uh, issue on this one, so no worries, but I can prepare, prepare you already. The subject will be, I'm leaning out of my window here a bit, but it's PROC 2006. And at first you'll find, uh, hang on, what's going on here? Um, am I in the right course? And uh, yes, you are. So this is advanced programming. That's it's kind of a, a companion course in a way, but it's really more focused on different programming languages where different programming languages are introduced with their features and so on, uh, and uh, including C++, Rust, uh, Haskell, Golan, and Java, and Kotlin, and so on. So a lot of different um, uh, languages. So the idea is really to go through languages and show their features, compare, interact with them, uh, learn more about paradigms, and so on. But one of them is Golang, and it's the starting one anyway, because many of you are expected to have some sort of Java background, for example, or if not, you're probably learning alongside anyway. And Golang is a good starting point. So, and we, we thought it would be most sense to kind of learn this at the same time, because some of you actually have this course uh, um, per default already anyway. It'd be very unfair if you had uh, possibly an advantage over it, because uh, Marsh will cover it as a uh, sensible depth, which is completely um, relevant for us. So that's why we joining those efforts. But I'll provide an email, uh, sorry, a issue here again. One reminder again, if you haven't already, go under issues labels in the in this uh, course repository here, right? And please subscribe to all the labels, all of them, announcement, course question, platform question, programming question sharing. Yeah? So I have done so and you should do as well. That means you get, especially announcements, you get an email uh, on the email address that you use to register yourself in this system. Uh, whenever someone posts something with the corresponding label. If you post something without a label, it's not uh, notified. No one is notified, hence important. 
but uh, you can expect an email by me uh, uh, um, later this afternoon or this evening <laughs> afternoon yeah evening um yeah so um what 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 we can do is um um, we are. Yeah, I'll provide. So there's a in quest inquiry to provide some 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 sort of head up heads up. So um, as you um, hopefully derived. Um, so for this week, I'm going to. I I can write this down as well. But for this week, the plan is to uh, entrench some Linux ideas based on the feedback I just got, which is really great. Appreciated. Uh, so we dip uh, likely into piping, uh, process management, and software management again for different. Um, well, yeah. The principles in general and specifically on Ubuntu. Um, hope to provide a bit of a um, 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 session that provides an overview there and deep dig a deep deep big deeper. And then for next week, I need to ask Marsh what he plans to do talk to talk about first. His sessions will be, and that needs to be absorbed with care at Tuesday at eight o'clock, eight fifteen, I believe. So quite eight thirty, sorry, eight thirty in the morning. And that's how he schedules it. Um, I'll provide all those details, um, and uh, he will, um, you know, start with GoLang basically from from scratch. And usually, the idea is to provide principles of GoLang um, and um, the um, other aspect that will then follow with data structures, um, writing uh, functions, and so on. So ba basic principles that you know from most other programming languages that you can, you know, relate to later on in um, Golang. And um, eventually, when it's about writing sockets and exposing functionality in terms of services, then we'll take over again and continue here in this course. Um, that's the idea. Um, question by Carol. Uh, will you stream or record or lectures regardless of Corona rules? Yes. They will all be streamed and uh, like that. unless technology, you know, in as far as technology permits or my brain permits, because uh, it, perhaps you need to sometimes remind me. I'm just uh, human as well. Sometimes it may just escape me. So uh, and then then it's of course an issue. But uh, generally, the default idea is to record all the lectures and provide them to you because they are also valuable because they are potentially exam relevant, right? So such as the topics we just talked about and the kind of motivations that we had. Um, about cloud technologies used earlier, uh, those are of course relevant for, for example, the exam and some other aspects as well. Yeah, but it's also good for you even if you have the more practical sessions that you can see and uh, recover some of the things that we did, especially if there's timing conflicts or you don't manage to attend. As I mentioned before, there's no uh, obligation to attend to the to to the lectures. We don't do that. We rely on your um, will to attend and your um, uh, sense of responsibility. Cool. So I'll provide this later on as well, alongside the slides that I used today. Any other questions for now? Otherwise, uh, we'll see each other on Wednesday. Goonstag at, uh, remind me, um, what was it again? Ah, now, now my whole thing hangs here. Um, I think it was 10 o'clock, I believe on Wednesday. It will recover eventually. Yeah, Wednesday 10, 15, right? 10 to 12. So we'll see you there. Same room, same time. Uh, no, different time, but same room. And yeah, cool. Well, thank you very much for your attendance. Feel free to uh, leave and I'll provide post recordings and uh, slides eventually after that session. Bye-bye, everyone.